On our last program, we discussed two lunar eclipses in 1996. In fact, we have the story in our October 1996 edition of Prophecy in the News. Two full lunar eclipses in 1996, both on Jewish holy days. There was one on April 3rd and 4th, uh, Passover, and the other was on uh, uh, September 26th uh, here in the United States. It was um, uh, in the evening time on the uh, Thursday night, and in Israel it was Friday morning just before sunrise. The same time, of course, about seven hours difference. I want us to continue our discussion because we just barely touched the surface of the significance of these two lunar eclipses. You'll not see another one until January of the year 2000. Gary Sturman is here to discuss with me Mystery of the Blood Moons. The Blood Moons. And that's of course what an, a fully eclipsed moon is. It uh, turns dark red and is, uh, has a, almost a spooky glow and has long been associated with the fall of emperors, with uh, social calamity, uh, various kinds of calamities. We've already pointed out uh, before uh, that uh, uh, in the uh, eclipse that took place just before Tabernacles, it was right in the middle of a shootout between the PLO and uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. And this is going right into the intermediate days uh, just prior to the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to be looking at the significance of the uh, symbolic significance of Tabernacles as we continue today. But before that, uh, we need to talk about the pilgrimage festivals. The, uh, the feasts of Israel uh, had among them three feasts that required a pilgrimage to the temple, J.R. And you know, Gary, I think it's important because the first full lunar eclipse occurred on Passover. Mm -hmm. And this was the first of three feasts through the year when every Jewish man was commanded to be at the uh, tabernacle or at the temple. Uh, to stand before the Lord. Now, not every man could make it to Jerusalem for Passover because of the harvest. Mm -hmm. And not every man could make it at Pentecost because of his work in the fields. But the final uh, festival, Tabernacles, was at the completion of the final harvest, especially noted as the harvest of the grapes. Mm. How true. So here we have three festivals in which men are required to stand before the Lord, but the first two, not everybody's going to be there. Yeah. And Gary, I think this is most important because I think these three festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, represents three, shall we say, resurrections. Mm -hmm. and the first resurrection occurred in the days following Passover, when the Bible tells us that at, at the resurrection of Christ, others came out of the graves, went into Jerusalem, and talked mm. to people. You know, J.R., at, uh, at the crucifixion of Christ, the, the solar system was disturbed somehow. The sun darkened. Uh, we experienced an earthquake, as you, you mentioned, the graves were open. So in Christ's first coming, uh, very significant things happened at that time, and among them, this resurrection, which has been the subject of much talk. And this kind of sets a theme. Uh, is it possible, Gary, that the resurrection that occurred at the resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. was of the Old Testament saints? Mm -hmm. It's possible. And so, in fact, the scripture tells us that he took, led captivity captive. And the general idea is that he emptied the bosom of Abraham, or paradise, and took all the Old Testament saints to heaven because they were awaiting the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ to pay for their sins. Mm -hmm. That was Adam and Abraham and David and all the people of the Old Testament were saved by faith but were not yet allowed to go into the presence of God in heaven because their sins had not yet been taken away. And the yeah. Lamb came to take away the sins of the world. In explaining this, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, refers to Christ as our Passover. His blood was shed so that the angel of death would pass over us, but he's also called first fruits. He's the first fruits of them that slept. Uh, first fruits meaning the first resurrected fruits. And when the first fruits uh, then are taken, you begin a 50 day count. Mm -hmm. And you count 50 days, which brings you then to the second pilgrimage festival. Yeah, and that would be Pentecost. Now, the fascinating thing about Pentecost is it's the night when the bride 
uh, goes to her groom. Most weddings were June weddings, you know. Yeah. And so the big question is, what prophetic significance does this have? Is it possible that the rapture and resurrection will occur someday on a Pentecost or a round of Pentecost? Uh, at least this was the second festival in which every man was required to stand before the Lord. And we know the next great resurrection or standing before the Lord will be the rapture and resurrection. And then the final one, Tabernacles. Tabernacles. And that will, to me, speaks of the great white throne judgment when everybody stands before the Lord. The dead are raised, the books were opened, and the dead are judged out of those books. Hmm. Three resurrections and basically three comings of Christ. The first time he came to his own, his own received him not. The second time he will come and meet those who uh, of the church age in the air. And the third time he will come to his own and they will recognize him. And J.R., we have this perfectly laid out in the Feasts of Israel and particularly in Tabernacles. That's interesting to me that the Jews remark that it is following the, the uh, harvest, the final harvest, the final ingathering, and they especially point out the gathering of the grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, this to me speaks of uh, Revelation when the grapes are gathered, that is, all nations uh, to Armageddon, mm -hmm. and the blood flows to the horse's bridle. So this Feast of Tabernacles represents uh, basically the tribulation period. In fact, um, it it's, covers quite a scope, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. <clears throat> you can look at it as seven years of tribulation, but more than that, you can look at it as seven thousand years. It, it really lays out the plan of uh, redemption for humanity from Adam to the present and beyond. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 23 and read the verses that deal with this Feast of Tabernacles. He says, Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. And it shall be for a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. One more Adam. Here, the next verse says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. So we have here a fascinating set of verses that describe what God wants of them in this prophetic scenario called Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a wonderful feast, and the way it used to be kept is very interesting. Now, as we go into tabernacles, we're going to get into the symbols of tabernacles, and you're going to see how they reveal Christ's activities yet to come, and we believe yet to come in the very near future. And it's interesting, J.R., that back in, in the days of the temple, uh, the day one of, of uh, tabernacles was kept with an incredible feast that took place going all the way through the day and into the night. When, when the, sun, uh, the sun went down on the, the end of the first day, <clears throat> they had lights lit up the Temple Mount. Yes. In fact, um, uh, Alfred Edersheim in his book, The Temple, Its Ministries and Services in the Days of Christ, says, at the close of the first day of the Feast of uh, the worshipers descended into the court of women where great preparations had been made. Four golden candelabras were there, each with four golden bowls, and against them rested four ladders, and four youths of the priestly descent held each a pitcher of oil capable of holding a hundred and twenty log, and from which they filled each bowl. The old worn breeches and girdles of the priests served for wicks to these lamps. There was not a court in Jerusalem that was not uh, lit up by the light of the house of water pouring. So the first and most important of these was the light of the first day. Mm -hmm. And Gary, <clears throat> what's so remarkable is the moon had a total eclipse. That's right. 
on the morning that that evening was the time for the light. So to me, it it uh, it has apocalyptic overtones. It really does. Uh, that happened, of course, in, in uh, Sukkot or Tabernacles of this year. Uh, where we should be saying, let there be light, suddenly the moon was darkened. We've got to take a break here, but when we come back, we've got a lot more. As Edershine told us in his book, The Temple, Its Ministry and Services as They Were in the Days of Christ, on the first night of the Feast of Tabernacles, there was the lighting of the huge candelabras in the court of women at the temple. Behind me, you can see a picture of the temple and this magnificent setting where four huge candelabras were lit using uh, oil, uh, using 120 logs of oil for each of the four lamps, uh, also using the worn out garments of the priesthood for the wicks to this lamp. And it occurred on the first night, Gary, to me, this speaks of the first day of creation when God said, let there be light. Everything about this is symbolic, including the worn out garments of the priesthoods. You know, <laughs> it uh, speaks of a passing priesthood into a new presence of Christ. And, and the number four appears uh, amazingly often in tabernacles. You have the four candelabra, you have the four species of, of trees, not the fig, but four other species of trees, which are then waved in four directions. Uh, J.R., all of this is incredibly metaphoric. Yeah, speaks of the world, the number four being the world, yes. isn't it? In fact, this, this uh, eclipse of the moon just before the first day of tabernacles uh, sounds like Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Mm. And there was light. So here we have the darkness just before that first uh, day, uh, the first night of light. This, this is incredible. So this uh, blood moon that we had uh, certainly appears to be prophetic and apocalyptic, a sign in the heavens. Yeah, and, and something else about tabernacles, and that is that in addition to this flame at the beginning, uh, every day after the first day, not the first day, but every day after, mm -hmm. had a uh, celebration called Nis, uh, Nisuk Hamayim, the water libation or the pouring out of the water every day. Yeah. Now that is a, that's rich. And it began on the second day, Gary. Absolutely. In the second millennium, there was the <laughs> flood of Noah. So you see these seven days of tabernacles gives us an overall view of the uh, 7,000 years of human history and uh, also seems to tie in with the seven days of creation. Mm. Seven days of creation represents 7,000 years of human history. And we've got this tremendous first day and second day with the let there be light and then the water on the second day. And each day thereafter, uh, the water represented uh, uh, a memorial mm. of the great flood of Noah. Now, all of this would be sort of a, an interesting exercise, but where it gets uh, more than interesting is when we link it to the person of Christ, which yeah. we do in John 7 and John 8. And uh, John 7 and 8, listen to those two numbers. Seven, yes. number of perfection, <laughs> eight, the number of the new birth. Well, nothing by accident here. <laughs> nothing by accident. We have a story about when Jesus came up to the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. And what did he do there? You well, know, up in Galilee, they said, come on up to the feast. You need to yeah. show yourself openly. He said, I'm not going. They went on up and began to look for him. He went up secretly. Mm -hmm. Secretly. And then what happened in the midst of the feast? This is exciting, Gary. Well, in uh, John 7, 10, uh, the, the brothers had gone on up. And then uh, went he also up to the feast, and not openly, but as it were, in secret. And in all the conversation was, where is he? Where is he? There's this kind of a buzz in Jerusalem. In the 14th verse, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, uh, saying, how knoweth this man letters, yeah. <laughs> having never learned. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is, Gary. 
And here's, here's the point that we want to make. Jesus entered the temple on the fourth day and began to teach. That's the, that's the fourth millennium, yes, Gary. Is. Jesus came after 4,000 years. His first advent was after 4,000 years of human history. So we have the first coming of Christ pictured in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, the story, as the story unfolds here, they are rejecting him. They are accusing him of all kinds of things. And uh, this is the rejection of Christ at his first advent. Absolutely is. The rejection of Christ at his first advent laid out along a timeline symbolized in, in tabernacles. This really gets interesting uh, because now we, we have uh, Jesus standing up on the last day of tabernacles. This would be day number seven. Uh, we have it in John 7, 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly uh, shall flow rivers of living water. And this, J.R., in the midst of the water libation festival, water is poured out every day. Mm -hmm. And on that last day, which is called Hoshana Rabbah, Jesus stood up and said, I'm the water. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> now, you've got to understand, folks, that these seven days of tabernacle picture 7,000 years of human history. And so on the fourth day, he came up and was rejected. That's his first advent uh, 2,000 years ago. On the seventh day, which I think represents the seventh millennium of human history, he will stand up again and he will say, I'm the water. I'm the one the water is talking about. And that is the great Hosanna Rabbah. Hosanna meaning save us. And this is a part of the Messianic blessing. Mm. This is what Jesus is waiting to hear. He's waiting to hear them say, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Is Matthew 21, 9. Uh, the multitudes went before and, and followed after Jesus on that day when he rode in on the donkey, uh, cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And uh, Jesus uh, was awaiting to hear the Messianic blessing. Matthew 23, 29, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is the Messianic blessing. Yeah. One of these days there will be a great Hosanna Rabbah for the house of David. They will... <laughs> seventh millennium. <laughs> it's the seventh millennium. And folks, the seventh millennium is coming up. It's just a few years away. Jesus is about to stand up on the last day of that great Feast of Tabernacles. Now, Tabernacles then pictures evidently the sojourn of man upon planet Earth for 7,000 years. Mm. <laughs> it is quite remarkable. It's not over yet. And by the way, you need, you need to sit down and read in the quiet of your own study. Read John 7 and 8. This will amaze you. Because now we come to chapter 8. <clears throat> this is the famous story, verses 1 through 11, of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, this would correspond in tabernacles to a Shemini Atzeret, which it means uh, remain with us one more day or remain with us upon the eighth day. Mm -hmm. The eight is the symbol of the new birth. And, and J.R., we have a picture here of Jesus, uh, shall we say, judging a woman who was caught in adultery. But yeah. it doesn't turn out like everybody thought it would. That's right. He forgives her. Yes, he does. And he tells her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Who is this woman, prophetically? Who is she an allegory of, Gary? She is an allegory of Israel, no yes. doubt about it. And the accusers, <laughs> they would be the apostates from all over the world. We see the accusers of Israel in the news media today. All you have to do is pick up the paper. The, the news media, uh, everyone is saying Israel is, has been caught sinning. And we need to judge Israel, you know? This is incredible. <laughs> so this, this tabernacle uh, that uh, is observed every year by the Jews is is definitely a prophetic picture of the 7,000 years of human history. And on the seventh day, he, he says, I'm the way to salvation. And on the eighth day, he forgives Israel. This, to me, is, is a picture also of the great white throne judgment at the end of the oh. seventh millennium, because then we get into eternity. Eternity yeah. begins to flow, which takes us to uh, the ninth day, doesn't it? <clears throat> the ninth day. <clears throat> and we have this in John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not 
wa walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is a reflection of day one, let there be light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And this is, would be corresponding to the ninth day, which is called Simcha Torah, or rejoicing in the Torah. Uh -huh. It's a picture of eternity in the presence of Christ. And actually deals with uh, Hakafot on that day, too. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the children of Israel take the Torah and they dance around in circles, endless interweaving circles called Hakafot. And these represent the cycles of creative growth. Yeah, and the cycles of eternity. Exactly. So you can see why we're so excited about uh, the two blood moons this year and their possible prophetic significance.